Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I was relaxing at home one Saturday afternoon when there was a knock at my door. When I opened it, I was surprised to see my neighbor Kate standing there with her 10-year-old son, Michael. Hey there, Kate said with an overly friendly smile. I hope you don't mind, but I told Michael he could come over to play with James today. Now James is my 9-year-old son. He and Michael are classmates and get along all right at school, but they've never had a play date or anything outside of school. Oh, I'm sorry, today's actually not a good day for a play date, I told her. James is at his grandparents' house this weekend. Kate's smile faded. What? But I told Michael he could play here. He's been looking forward to this all day. I felt bad, but I wasn't about to invite some kid I barely knew into my home without warning. I'm really sorry, I didn't realize you had made plans with James, I said. Maybe we can set up a proper play date next weekend when I know in advance. Kate scowled, looking impatient. Well, what are we supposed to do now? I can't just send Michael home. I have things to do today. I was a bit taken aback by her entitled attitude, as if it was my responsibility to look after her son with no notice. I'm afraid I have plans today, too, I told her firmly. I can't watch Michael with no warning. I'm sure you understand. Kate put her hands on her hips, gearing up for an argument. But before she could say anything, Michael grabbed her arm. It's okay, Mom, we can just go home, he said glumly. Kate shook him off in annoyance. No, you were promised a play date, and you're going to get one. Then she turned back to me with a fake smile plastered on her face. Oh, come on, can't he just come in for a little bit, she cajoled. The boys can play video games or something, I'll be back to get him in an hour. I stood my ground. I'm sorry, Kate, but like I said, I don't have time to watch Michael today. She dropped the facade, reverting to the angry scowl. You're really going to leave my son stranded outside? She snapped. What kind of neighbor are you? At this point, I'd had enough of her guilt tripping. I gave you a reasonable solution. We can plan a proper play date next weekend, I said. But I'm not having Michael come inside unsupervised when I don't know what your plans are. I'll see you later. I started to close the door, but Kate stuck her foot in the way. Let me talk to your husband then, she demanded. Surely he'll be more accommodating. Now I was getting angry. My husband isn't home either, and he would say the same thing, I said sharply. Please remove your foot. You're preventing me from closing my own front door. Not until you agree to watch Michael, she shouted. Suddenly Michael spoke up again. Mom, stop it. Let's just go. He seemed embarrassed by her behavior. Kate ignored him completely. I had run out of patience. If you don't move your foot, I'm calling the police, I warned. Go ahead, call them, Kate yelled. I'll tell them how you're refusing to let a child into your home. That was it. I took out my phone and dialed cop right in front of her. Kate seemed stunned that I had actually done it. Cop, what's your emergency? The operator answered. Hi, I'm calling to report a trespassing incident, I said calmly. My neighbor has her foot wedged in my front door preventing me from closing it. I've asked her multiple times to remove it, but she refuses. While I described the situation, Kate suddenly retracted her foot, looking panicked. I thanked the operator and hung up. Kate snatched Michael's hand and stormed away without another word. I closed the door, shaking my head in disbelief. What kind of person tries to force their way into someone else's home? And then calls the police over, not getting their way. About twenty minutes later, there was another knock at the door. I looked through the peephole to see two police officers. My jaw dropped as I realized Kate had actually called the cops on me. I opened the door and attempted to explain the situation, but the officers held up a hand to stop me. Your neighbor told us you assaulted her son and forcibly kept him out of your home, one officer said sternly. She wants to press charges. I was completely flabbergasted. That is absolutely not true, I insisted. She showed up unannounced, wanting me to babysit her son with no notice. I politely declined and she tried to wedge her foot in the door, preventing me from closing it. The officers looked uncertain about who to believe. Is your son home? Can you bring him out here? The other officer asked. No, my son is away this weekend. That's why I couldn't have his friend over to play, I explained. Just then I noticed Michael peeking out from behind Kate's front door across the street, watching the whole scene unfold. I pointed over to him. That's her son right there. Why don't you go ask him what happened? I suggested. The officers walked over and spoke to Michael for a few minutes before returning. Your neighbor's son corroborated your version of events, the first officer told me. 
It seems she fabricated the story about the assault. I knew it, I cried in exasperation. She wanted me to babysit with no notice, and when I said no, she tried to physically force her way into my home. We see this from time to time, the second officer said. People get angry when they feel entitled to something and the other person won't comply, but making false accusations is a serious offense. The officers took down my statement along with my intention to press charges for filing a false police report. They also spoke to Kate, warning her about potential consequences for her actions. A few days later, I received a notice that Kate was being charged for providing false information to law enforcement. I decided to also pursue a restraining order preventing her from coming near my home after the way she tried to forcibly enter. The judge granted the order agreeing that Kate's behavior demonstrated a lack of boundaries and respect for my space. We also discussed setting up parameters for our sons to interact since they were classmates. The school arranged for them to be in separate classes and kept under supervision during recess. I was relieved to have the law on my side in this particular neighborhood dispute. The experience taught me you really can't be too trusting, even with people you've known for years. I never would have expected my neighbor to react so inappropriately over something so minor. But the justice system prevailed in the end, and hopefully Kate learned that she can't make up serious accusations without consequences. The restraining order also gave me peace of mind that she won't be able to invade my home or property again anytime soon, and I can finally relax in my own house, knowing the authorities won't believe every wild tale from a disgruntled Karen next door. The next one is a pro-revenge story. This story is in four parts, and I apologize for the length. I also apologize for any teacher slang I use as it is second nature, just like military jargon was during my time in the military. Basically, I was told that all the assistant vice principals in the district other than at the high school were being let go, and a teacher on assignment, TOA, was going to take our jobs. I was not heartbroken over this, but was treated badly by the new admin team taking my job and my principal's job. Also, I tried to help my staff on my way out, and it seems my bosses cared more about their image than my staff's happiness. So here is the story. Part 1. So none of the other admin in my district had received our contracts for the coming school year yet. I was wondering what was going on, but I heard rumors about a pay scale shift, and that was the reason for it. I found out Wednesday what is actually happening. Every assistant principal and vice principal in the district, why we have two different titles, I have no idea, is not getting renewed contracts, except the ones at the HS. Their positions are being eliminated, and their jobs are being replaced with a new position that pays a teacher's salary plus a $2,000 stipend. They are replacing the APs with learning coordinators. Apparently, the budget is the given reason, but I also heard rumors from someone at the district office. Each of us, APs, sought VPs, was scheduled to meet with one of the ASST supers Wednesday. We thought it was about our contracts, and we were correct. When I arrived, the acting superintendent was there with the head of HR. I was told about the elimination of my position, but not the reasons why. I was then given an option for the coming school year. I could go back into the classroom, I could work in the district office, or I could apply an interview for the new position that is replacing my job. What the duck? I wouldn't care one bit if I was told that my position had been cut completely and I needed to go back into the classroom. I love the classroom. I miss teaching full-time. However, to tell me to apply an interview for a job I already have is bullcrap. We were told to give the district our answers by Friday and they would draw up contracts or schedule interviews. Wednesday afternoon, I went to see Tony, who is an ASST, superintendent and one of the few decent leaders in the school district. I heard from Tony that there was an internal shakeup, but he wasn't allowed to talk about it or even give me a hint about what happened. However, one of the ASST, Supers was being reassigned, aka demoted, to being the principal of my current school. My principal was not coming back due to health reasons. The superintendent was released from his contract, and my school's new learning coordinator position had already been filled. Who filled it? a school counselor from one of the high schools who just happens to be a friend and lackey of the ASST. Sup. That is now the new principal. So early this morning, I gave them my answer. I decided that I didn't need until Friday to decide. I tried to make sure I sounded professional, but I made sure that my message was getting across by speaking with authority. 
I went into the acting superintendent's office and told him that I thought that laying off a bunch of people so they could hire others to do the same job but at less pay was bullcrap. I told him that the way the school district handled certain situations was idiotic. I then gave several examples. I next told him that he was going to ruin a perfectly good school with an amazing team of educators by putting a lazy, mean, parent-pleasing person in as its new principal and letting her put a lackey in as her second-in-command. I said that she was as useless as a screen door on a submarine and as mean as Dolores Umbridge. I finished the three-minute speech by stating that I will work my ass off and finish the school year strong. I will prep things for the next school year so that the teachers have an easier time. I also let him know I would never work at or recommend the district to anyone ever again. Then I left, letting him know that I expect an amazing letter of recommendation by the end of the school day Friday afternoon, since I earned it for my service the past few years. So what am I going to do now? Well, I called up an old friend Wednesday who is currently a principal at a steam charter school that's part of a chain of charter steam schools, and asked if he had a teaching position available. He's been asking me every year for the past five years to come work for him. He told me he had three openings, and I could have my pick of them. So next year I will be a, drum roll please, sixth grade teacher, and I am very happy about it. I even get to design my curriculum as long as it meets state standards. I could apply elsewhere for admin positions, but I think I need a break from school leadership. I need to love my work again like I used to as a teacher. Yes, there were are many challenges, and sometimes I hated going to work, but I do love being a teacher. I feel bad for my current staff because the regime change will hit them hard, but there is nothing I can do about it. I wish I could help them. The most I could do would be to take a teaching position at my current school, but then I would be miserable with them and be helpless to do anything to aid them. So, for myself and my daughter, who I love more than anything, I am making the move to a new school and going back to what I enjoy doing, teaching. I am even bringing my daughter to my new school to start next year as a fifth grader. I asked her if she wanted to stay at her current school or go to the STEAM school with me, and she wants to go with me. She was excited since she has visited there several times and loves the technology room, the robotics class, and the science labs. Plus, she is friends with some of the kids there already. As a goodbye to my staff, I am going out this weekend, and I am going to buy some nice letter paper and scratcher tickets. I'm going to write short, individualized goodbyes to each of my staff members, and at the end, I will include the following words. I'm giving you some scratcher tickets. My hope is that you are as lucky scratching them as I have been lucky to have worked with you. So that's it. I have to finish my contract. But at the end of June, I am free. I am looking forward to teaching full-time again, and having a boss who will let me just do my job and not interfere. I don't think I want to work in administration again, but maybe after a few years, I will decide to work as an AP again. Part 2. So I put together goodbye gifts for all my staff, and I'll be handing them out Friday, their last day with kids. They have a bunch of goodies that I posted about weeks ago. I was thinking this weekend about how to give the finger one more time to the district office and help my teachers out, even in a small way, so I came up with it Sunday night. My district requires each teacher to attend additional training throughout the year. These are outside of the regular staff development trainings. They are run by district staff, SPED teachers, and admin. The training normally lasts one, three hours, and the teacher gets a certificate for the time spent in the training. Each teacher is required to attend 24 hours of these before the end of the school year. Most teachers take them over the summer if they are offered, so they don't have to take them during the school year. So yesterday morning, before work, I was making copies of the certificates for all the courses I have run here in the past few years. Classroom management strategies, lockdown procedures, social studies strategies, math strategies, reading comprehension, and environmental print. I'm going to fill them out with each of the teacher's names and the number of hours. I'm adding all the times I ever spoke to the staff about these topics and putting down hours to correspond, rounding up to the nearest hour-ish. Wouldn't you know each of those topics was three to five hours in length? Each staff member will have exactly 24 hours worth of training. I filled out the dates of the training for the 2022-2023 school year. Oh, and I have an attendance sheet with all of their names and have them marked as being present. Note. 
I checked with the district, and since I am still an administrator into the summer, I am allowed to run these training over the summer before I leave. Now they can have their summer to themselves and not worry about taking classes during the school year. They can if they wish, but 99% of teachers here hate the mandatory training hours. I hope the staff likes the present. Part 3 since Friday, I'm no longer a school administrator. I technically have another week to work, but I took vacation during that time because, well, screw them. Now, I spent the last week packing up, giving aid and comfort to my now former staff, and causing problems for the new administrators who are a-holes. Now, besides giving the entire staff a year free from additional PDs, I wasn't planning on causing any more problems, just quietly leave and drive off into the sunset. Shane style. But no, apparently I don't deserve a quiet week. The new principal, demoted from ASST Super, and her new teacher on assignment, TOA, decided for some reason to be rude to me. There was only one response to that. I aimed to misbehave. How were they rude to me, you ask? First off, they ordered me to hurry and clean out my office. Apparently, the TOA wanted to start redecorating my office. I was literally told, Get all your personal stuff out of here ASAP. She wants her office now. I still had a week to work there and actual work to do. Second, the new principal tried to steal my personal chair and my personal office supplies and decorations. That chair was a gift to me from a friend. I found her just wheeling it out of my office and into hers. My desk supplies and a banner from my wall were stacked on its seat. I told her that it was my personal chair, not the district's. She said, okay. The very next morning I found it missing. She had moved it into her office after I left for the day. Third, I was given a list of tasks to complete by Friday by the TOA, who is in no way, shape, or form my boss. These were not my job to do and are in fact the incoming admin's duty to complete. Stuff the new admin are supposed to do. Things like put together new staff packets, schedule next year's PDs, fill out and submit request forms, etc. Finally, I was talked down to every single day by the new admin team, I was spoken to as though I were the hired help and they were the royal idiots. Seriously, I speak to a waitress that messes up my order with 20x, the amount of respect that they showed me. They actually tried to get my attention by snapping their fingers at me. Like that would work. Note. The new principal also has made some pretty anti-LGBTQ plus comments. I don't like narrow-minded people. So I decided to do as I was told. I was a soldier so I know how to follow orders. I removed everything that was my personal property. That included my chairs, decorations, the stress relievers, punching bag, etc., the fridge from the office, and the file cabinets in my office. Yes, I bought government surplus cabinets because I didn't have any. All my files and all of my former principal's files were in there. I had even bought the manila folder I used in it. So I took every piece of paper out of my cabinets, removed them from my labeled folders, and stack them on the floor into one large pile. There is no order to how they are stacked. I took my chair from the principal's office while she was in a meeting with parents. I just walked in and rolled it out. She stopped talking to the parents to ask what I was doing, and I responded that I was taking my personal property out ASAP as I was ordered to do. I had an old medium-sized fridge I had placed in the office workroom for office staff to store their food in, but it is mine so I took the fridge. I brought it right out the front door and loaded it into my truck. I even took the new admin's food out of it and left them on the table. It's my fridge. I warned the rest of the office staff I was taking it, but forgot to tell admin. Darn. I copied all my digital files over to a flash drive and then deleted everything off my work Google Drive, anything I personally created or designed, copied all my emails too. I informed the staff that if they need time off next year and need it approved, to submit the forms to me this week. I got several and they are all now approved. I got this idea from someone who messaged me here on Reddit and suggested I do this. Thanks for the advice. I approved every supply list item the staff submitted and even drove to the district warehouse to pick up some items personally. I even approved funds for a secondhand kiln for the art teacher. She found a good one on Craigslist. I had repaired my desk with bolts and tools from home. I took the bolts back. The desk is now lopsided again. The closet door was broken when I got there. So I repaired it. I have now put it back as it was when I was hired. The two-way mirror to the detention room was mine. I had gotten it from a friend at another school, different district.
It allowed me to watch ISS and detention students from my office without them seeing me. It popped right out, and I took it home. Now the TOA has a hole in the wall the detention kids can look out through. I had put together all the lockdown buckets and fire drill bags myself with my own money. I took all of them back. This I felt bad about, but I will give them out to the staff at my new school. I put a rush order on all classroom and building repairs, and have an approved order to have every classroom repainted. I assembled new staff packets and the new school year binders. Besides the basics of what is required, I have included throughout the binders in random places, Dilbert cartoons, famous Harry Potter quotes, the lyrics to Nickelback's How You Remind Me, I Kissed a Girl by Katy Perry, All Star by Smash Mouth, and We Built This City by Starship a map of the area where I marked all the good places to eat lunch off campus, funny farside teacher comics, cheesy teacher jokes, the union contact info, crosswords, sudoku, and word searches, a list of educational lawyers, just in case. I also included in the binder the admin Wi-Fi password for them since that signal is stronger for some reason. I went ahead and wrote out the PD schedule for next year. Oddly, every Wednesday is listed as free time or work in your classroom. I'm sure they will change it, but I don't know when they will find out what it says. I had a master list of donators and partners in the community. It was posted on a whiteboard in my office. I got over four dozen businesses and people in the community to help with various things or donate over the years. I spent a lot of my time building relationships with them and making deals. I took a photo of it and then I erased the list and took the whiteboard since it was mine. Friday I flew the LGBTQ plus flag instead of the state flag. I also placed LGBTQ plus flags in each classroom in case the staff want to display them. Then I got yelled at. Three times. The first time was when I took back my chair. I was told it was unprofessional to just take it without asking, especially with guests present. I responded with, yes, it was unprofessional to take my chair without asking. The second time was when the TOA found the refrigerator gone. She said that it was community property. I told her, no, it's my property, and I was told to take all my property from the campus. The third time was when I was in the parking lot leaving, and they found the piles of papers. The principal flagged me down and told me to clean it up. I told her I was off the clock and that the district never reimbursed me for the cabinets, so I had to take them with me. I'm expecting a call from HR today asking for my assistance in setting everything back up, since with all my stuff removed and erased, the admin team has to actually put in some hard work. I'd come in for my consultant rate, $75 an hour with a minimum contract for 12 hours, part four. So, as some of you know, I left the world of being an administrator a few weeks ago. I tried to leave behind some nice gifts when I left. I wasn't looking to cause problems in my last few weeks, but the new admin team treated me in a way that was unacceptable. So I decided that Malcolm Reynolds had it right when he said, I aim to misbehave. Well, the Tuesday after I left, I received a call from HR. I ignored it. I then left for a road trip with my daughter where we went to San Francisco for a few days and attended two Giants games. Unfortunately, they lost both games. While we were on our trip, they called and emailed me at my personal email account. My work one was deleted by them. I ignored the calls and never opened the emails. My daughter and I then went to Disneyland for a few days of fun and then returned this past Friday. I then checked the voicemails and emails. I was asked begged, and then ordered to come to HR for important meetings. It is very important that we speak to you as soon as possible, is what they said repeatedly. So yesterday I went into the district office wearing cargo shorts, a shirt I got at Disneyland, and flip-flops. I don't work there, so I don't need to dress up. When I arrived, I was originally treated like a visiting VIP. The HR manager and her assistant tried to butter me up like a Pillsbury biscuit. After a few minutes of them trying to make small talk and me then letting them know I had plans to go to lunch in 30 minutes, they got to the point. They wanted me to turn over a few things I took with me that, though they belonged to me, they said were sorely needed at the school. They gave me a list from the new principal which included, but was not limited to, my chair, seriously, my refrigerator and appliances, my community contacts board, people businesses that I built relationships and partnerships with, my personally designed forms and worksheets, two-way mirror, my lockdown buckets and fire drill bags. They also wanted copies of every record I kept and notes I took on the staff and students. 
The notes I took on the staff were so I could personalize gifts for them and have conversations with them about their interests. I said no to all those requests. I told the ladies that the furniture and appliances were mine that I brought in. I stated that the chair was a gift to me from a friend and that the new principal can afford to buy her own chair. I also stated that I left any official school district documents there, and any I took with me and or deleted were of my own making and my intellectual property. I also stated that my contacts were developed over the years on my personal time and at personal cost to me. I also stated that everything I took that I had submitted reimbursement was never reimbursed. I kept my records and pay stubs. I never saw a red cent from those submissions. They offered to pay me for some of the items and gave me a rough figure of what the district would pay me to return the fridge, the forms, buckets, bags, mirror, and contact board. I told them that I did not want to hand them over to the new admin team since they had treated me so poorly. They asked me again and tried to reason that some of those things could be interpreted as school property. I told them that they were welcome to try and force me to return anything that was legally mine to them, but I would be willing to fight it in court. I also told them that those two new administrators made me uncomfortable and that their treatment of me could be considered making a hostile work environment, especially when they tried to make me do their jobs for them. I then gave the HR team my lawyer's info. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.